Conservative political commentator Pierce Morgan may describe himself as a nonpartisan centrist, but the reality is he continues to demonstrate that he holds the Democratic Party and the American left to a much higher standard than the Republican Party and the American right, led by his ex-BFF, Donald Trump. But before we unpack all that, if you end up liking this video and you want to support the channel, please be sure to hit the like, subscribe, and alert bell before you go. I'd greatly appreciate it. All right, friends, we have several clips to look at in this video. Piers Morgan is somebody who frustrates me quite a bit because when he's at his best, he's pretty good. He's a pretty good interviewer. He's a pretty good debater when he wants to be, particularly on issues of foreign policy, when he plays the devil's advocate no matter whom he's talking to. So if he's talking to Cenk Uger or Rabbi Shmuley, he will play the devil's advocate and force them to wrestle with uncomfortable notions. It makes for great content. It's uh, also like, you know, practicing journalistic integrity. And he styles himself as a nonpartisan journalist. But when it comes to American politics, he doesn't really adopt that formula. When he has right-wing Trump-supporting guests on, he just throws them one softball after another and doesn't really make them contend with uncomfortable notions. And he constantly demonstrates that he grades Trump and the Republicans and right-wingers on a curve compared to Biden, Democrats, and the left. And so here he's having a conversation with the former guitarist of Mumford & Sons who recently debated former Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi. And we'll play this clip and unpack it together. Now, she ha she thinks the whole Trump movement, MAGA, conservatives, mm. she's saying that they're ethno nationalists. I would argue she is practicing demagoguery by saying that. Why? Mm. Because she is playing to the prejudice of some progressive Americans or elite Americans mm. that half of the country are racists. That's demagoguery. Well, it goes, it goes back to Hillary talking about the basket of deplorables. And we see this again and again, the language they use about Trump supporters Bearing in mind, he got nearly 80 million votes second time, 10 million more than the first time. Yeah. So she's basically calling a large swathe of the country, you know, sort of imbeciles, fascists, Nazis, whatever they, language they want to use. This is what I have a problem with when they do this. They try and demonize a whole group of tens of millions of Americans. That sounds really bad. That sounds really bad. And you might have a point, Pierce, if the right and Republicans and MAGA and Trump didn't do that all the time. And even then, you still might have a point to complain about Democrats. But if you're being consistent and nonpartisan, as you say you are, you should also be calling out Trump, MAGA, MAGA Republicans, Republican Congress people, and right-wingers when they demonize the left, when they demonize President Biden, when they demonize Democratic voters, when they, Demo they demonize progressives, liberals, the media, people in blue cities, blue states, women, marginalized groups, minorities, the disabled, et cetera, and so forth. But he never talks about that because, again, he grades the right on a curve. It's okay. They can say whatever they want. That's part of their shtick. It's the Democrats. It's the left. It's Biden. It's Pelosi. It's, it's all these people who are not Republicans and conservatives. They're the ones who should really watch what they say. Now, I'm going to remind you of some clips here in a second of what prominent Republicans have said about their opposition, the Democrats. But before I do, I also want to point out, because Pierce appealed to Trump's popularity, Donald Trump has never won the popular vote against a Democratic rival. So Hillary Clinton's a great example. She was more popular than Donald Trump, which is why she earned three to four million more votes than he did. Same thing in 2020. You say, well, he got 10 million more votes in 2020 than he did in 2016. And yet, and he still lost by more than 7 million votes to Joe Biden. So there's no question which of the two sides is generally more popular. But with that in mind, this is what Marjorie Taylor Greene, a sitting Republican congresswoman, has to say regularly about the Democratic Party. She says that are over the top like the Democrats are a party of pedophiles. I would definitely say so. They support grooming children. So that's a sitting Republican congresswoman not nine years ago, not eight years ago, like Hillary Clinton in the basket full of deplorables. You see, this is again goes to show the double standard because Pierce is fixated on Hillary Clinton, who is not the president, who is not secretary of state, who's not a senator. She is a former presidential candidate, former secretary of state, former senator. She, she's, she's basically, she doesn't, she's nowhere near as prominent within the Democratic Party as Marjorie Taylor Greene is with the Republican Party. And he's fixated on stuff that she said nine years ago and doesn't care at all what people like Marjorie Taylor Greene have to say within the past six months, right? But here's Marjorie Taylor Greene demonizing the Democratic Party, more people than the Republican Party, as not 50% deplorables, but as an entire party of groomers and pedophiles. Why the double standard, Pierce? Why don't you care about what Democrats have to say? Is civility just a one-sided thing? Can 
Republicans say just whatever they want, whenever they want about their opposition, but Democrats have to keep their mouth shut and just play by Marcus of Queensberry rules. Interesting. Actually, a CNN reporter called out this phenomenon, this double standard as well. And so we're going to play some of this clip because it, it's, it's just chef's kiss. I think it's a good point. I think it's one that I think you, you could see reflected in a very different approach that you heard from the former president in Indianola in Iowa on Sunday. Take a listen. So we have to have fair and free elections or we don't have a country. But these caucuses are your personal chance to score the ultimate victory over all of the liars, cheaters, thugs, perverts, frauds, crooks, freaks, creeps, and other quite nice people. That's a mouthful. I, I was being sarcastic there. Like, that, like, it's the thing that I don't understand about this, and I'm not criticizing Jamie Dimon or that view of, of, of what he's saying or what you're saying about Hillary Clinton and the deplorables candidate. It's like Trump says awful things about Democrats and supporters of Joe Biden and supporters of Hillary Clinton and everything like that way worse than deplorables or you don't like them and no one seems to care like the correct because it's a double standard pierce morgan's not the only one by the way a lot of a lot of liberals do this too uh where again they they feel that they're obligated to be super kind and charitable to the opposition and don't seem to care at all that the opposition doesn't reciprocate whereas i believe we need to pick a standard as a society, and hopefully it is the civil standard. I would love to live in a West Wing style universe where we could just litigate sincere disagreements in good faith with one another. Um, but we we have to have a, the same standard. And if MAGA's notion is, well, you can throw names at each other, you can get blunt with each other, you can be, you know, throw verbal jabs, well, then it has to go both ways. But unfortunately, Pierce Morgan doesn't want it to go both ways. What he wants, because he is more right than left, is he wants Trump, MAGA Republicans, MAGA, and the American right to be able to say whatever the hell they want about whomever the hell they want, and nobody ever be able to talk about it. But I reject that, and so should you, quite frankly. We should reject the double standard and be even crueler. <laughs> we should be even more direct, more blunt about what the right wing has become under Donald Trump. And if they don't like it, then we say, listen, if you want civility politics, then you have to reciprocate. You need to start being kind to us. Donald Trump, you should stop talking about your opponents that way. And if you don't, we'll call you out because we want Democrats to talk about us nicely. Jessica Tarlov, um, you know, my favorite Fox News uh, contributor. She's one of the few liberal slash progressive contributors to Fox News. She actually put it pretty directly to Kayleigh McEnany, Donald Trump's former press secretary, which I think just beautifully sums this whole thing up. A while ago, obviously Hillary Clinton is someone who is incredibly important to the party, and I have defended her comments um, in that interview, talking about the fact that Democrats are so far from being in a cult on a comparative basis to Republicans, it's actually laughable. And I do really struggle to find it in my tiny liberal heart to feel terrible <laughs> for Republicans when we we get called things like communists, socialists, thugs, pedophiles. Donald Trump called Democrats every name in the book. It is part of the Republican playbook to demonize us and to make it seem like it is the end of the world if Democrats are in power. Again, beautifully said, we cannot, we will not play to an asymmetry. So if Pierce has a problem with the way that Democrats, some Democrats talk about Republicans, then he should, if he is genuinely a nonpartisan centrist journalist who holds everybody to the same standard, actually show that, then he should start calling out Republicans like Donald Trump, like Marjorie Taylor Greene and others, and forcing right-wing guests who appear on his show who complain, like this ex-Mumford and Sons guitarist who complains about the lack of civility coming from Hillary Clinton. What he should say was, okay, I take your point. However, Donald Trump, Marjorie Taylor Greene have said all kinds of terrible things about the Democrats. So are you saying there should be a double standard which benefits your side of the aisle? Or are you prepared today, sir, to condemn Donald Trump and Marjorie Taylor Greene and others for their vicious, divisive rhetoric against the opposition? That would be an interesting question. That would create good content. That would be good pushback. And that would be Pierce, you know, playing the devil's advocate the way he often does with respect to matters of foreign policy. But he just won't do it when it comes to domestic policy when he's talking to a right winger. I want to play one other clip here too about from the same interview, but about a separate issue, which is false equivalence between the January 6th insurrection and um, various riots which occurred in 2020 after the murder of George Floyd. And I'm sure Congresswoman Pelosi will agree 
that the entire month of June 2020, when the federal courthouse in Portland, Oregon was under siege and under insurrection by radical progressives, those two were dark days for America. Yes? There is no equivalence there. I'll play that again just on that little bit because it was her reaction which I found so striking. A refusal to accept any equivalence, even though people on the left in that circumstance in Oregon had taken over a public building and for all intents and purposes were trying to thwart democracy. Yeah. So the problem with that is, and this is why Pelosi was right on the substance, Pelosi was right to say there is no equivalence, and there's not. And this is what Republicans do. This is, we, we talk about this. This is what they do with respect to election denialism. When you point out that Donald Trump is the sitting president, tried to overthrow a free and fair election, tried to litigate his way into a second unelected term, you know, fomented an insurrection at the Capitol, resisted the peaceful transfer of power, they say, well, what about Stacey Abrams? You know, when she ran for governor of Georgia, sure, she didn't try to sue her way into a term. Sure, she didn't try to resist the peaceful transfer of power. Sure, she just said that the election was unfair. But aren't those basically the same thing? No, they're not. They're not. A carjacker and a murderer are both criminals, but it would be stupid. It would be irrational. It would be dishonest to pretend that that's the end of the analysis. Oh, a car, you know, a shoplifter and a murderer, they're both criminals. One is considerably worse than the other, and it would be dishonest to pretend that that's not the case. So Pelosi was right to say, listen, there's, there's no equivalence. Now, could she have said, yeah, that was bad, but there's no equivalence, and what happened on January 6th was much worse? Should she have phrased it better? Perhaps. But the main thrust, which is that there's no equivalence, is factually true. Donald Trump as the sitting president had the highest individual constitutional and civic obligation to facilitate the peaceful transfer of power much higher than anyone in Portland, Oregon, or anywhere else, because he was a civic public officer, the highest in the land, and with great power comes great responsibility. So if you are the most powerful, which Trump was, you have the most responsibility more than anybody. And he failed. And that's worth, that's infinitely more important than what happened at an Oregon courthouse. I'm sorry, it just is. Also, it was the federal building. It would have, it would have prevented the election of the most powerful and important office in this country. People at the, the Cortland or the Portland courthouse were not trying to resist the results of a free and fair election. They weren't trying to prevent the peaceful transfer of power. They were protesting. They were rioting, perhaps illegally. And if they broke the law, prosecute them. But to pretend that what happened at a courthouse in Portland, Oregon, is comparable to what happened at the federal building, in the United States Capitol, fomented by a sitting president, Joe Biden wasn't encouraging people to seize courthouses in Portland, Oregon. He also wasn't president at the time, I might add, even if he did, which he didn't. So this is what I mean. Even Pierce, who, by the way, has condemned January 6th, can't help but be like, ah, oh, listen, sure, what the right did was so much worse, but that, that, that just that doesn't feel right. So I have to pretend that this thing in Portland, Oregon is, is basically the same. It's not. It's not even close. And it's, again, it's irrational and dishonest to pretend to indulge a false equivalence where a natural one doesn't exist. A cold is bad. Stage four cancer is worse. We would never pretend otherwise. Carjacking or shoplifting or whatever, shoplifting is bad. But mass murder is worse. Likewise, what happened on January 6th was infinitely worse than anything we have ever seen in terms of election denialism from Democrats. It's worse than any rioting that we saw during the George Floyd protest, because again, this happened at the behest of the sitting president, priming his cult to help him break the peaceful transfer of power so he could stay in office for a second term, this time unelected. That's infinitely more dangerous and deserves infinitely greater scrutiny. So anyway, Pierce Morgan's got to get his act together because again, he can do better than this. He should do better than this. And he needs to be better at a time when we're really counting on him. Let me know what you think in the comments.